let's start by saying that, okay, I think why do we need DevOps? Um, I think our audience is both uh, large companies uh, with where like DevOps is a standard. There's a lot of people in the IT team as well as like really young companies who are just starting out or maybe in their seed series A, B round wherein they probably may not have DevOps engineers. So, so I think let's start with that. Then we talk about like what really are the cost centers within DevOps, like where does the actual money go? Um, and then obviously, like James said, I mean, surprisingly, it can be somewhat co complex. So in the sense that we look at the factors that influences, let's see like how potentially you could look at various options to uh, reduce DevOps spend. And um, of course, throughout the call, uh, we'll weigh in and bring in Ajay and see if he can share um, about how he um, did the stuff in Kami and in his previous life and so on. All right. Um, so yeah, I think maybe a little bit of an introduction about uh, um, myself. I think uh, James talked about, um, I'm the founder and CEO for Duplo Cloud. Um, I'm a developer by background, started my career at Microsoft, um, and then was an early engineer in Azure and the first engineer in Azure networking team. Um, we sort of, so to speak, uh, uh, saw Azure grow from maybe a few hundred odd uh, servers to a few million virtual machines. And uh, um, uh, and we just had a handful of people who would manage that across the globe with the latest and greatest as compliance and whatnot. And across the pond, we had Amazon uh, who were like eight times bigger than us. So in general, I think learning from that, like all those hyperscale automation techniques that they had and how they have such minimalistic operations spent, um, we thought that we would create a product around that um, to create DevOps as a service and bring those technologies to mainstream IT and how people could efficiently operate to the same scale or rather the reduced cost. So today we have about like 75 customers for Duplo Cloud. Um, there are like 800 plus developers and DevOps engineers who use the platform on a daily basis and they do 50,000 plus infrastructure changes. And these are not just like CI CD builds that they're changing, they're actually making infrastructure changes. 2000 servers, thousands of applications and security and compliance is our bread and butter. Um, we enable um, about 45 certifications um, uh, across these organizations for their desired compliance standard like SOC 2, ISO, PCI, HIPAA. So in that sense, I think that's our background um, in the sense and uh, probably there can be some value about uh, on how what we have seen about DevOps spend and, and we can talk to that. Yes, yeah, so that's was the intro. Um, James, we can go next. Absolutely. And so actually one, one thing I wanted to say is if you have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to add it uh, ask a question in the question section in the top right-hand corner. Um, we will happily address that um, at the end of the webinar. We'll, we'll have a Q&A session um, and we'll go through all of your questions. Um, but first things yeah. first, why um, do we actually need that? <laughs> actually, um, that, that's gonna... interesting. Yeah, I know. It's a bit of a uh, softball actually, question. Uh, so but... so it, I, I think there are a few factors that are uh, um, uh, um, that determine it. Firstly, let's start by saying, like, what do DevOps people do, right? So their job are, like, basically um, deploying infrastructure, or deploying your applications into the cloud, securing them, uh, maintaining this application in terms of an uptime. If things go wrong, they probably are sometimes the first line of defense. In some cases, the developer themselves could be as well. Uh, but And if you're operating in a regulated industry, they are the one who would basically make sure that the infrastructure is compliant to uh, um, compli uh, compliant to what uh, <clears throat> to the standard that you need to meet. You know, interestingly, the word DevOps actually originally meant uh, developer are doing ops themselves. So in that sense, it's, uh, it's rather interesting um, that DevOps today is actually not developer doing ops. For most likely, it's a separate job profile wherein people are dedicated to do some specialized skills. Um, and typically, they would need to know coding because they need to do automation using things like Terraform, infrastructure as a code. Um, they need to be an operator, so need to know all about operations. They also need to be a um, compliance and a security guru. And, uh, and yeah, I think they are uh, really sought after <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, people with very, very niche skills. So you need them in summary to um, build secure and compliant infrastructures in your cloud. If you're not operating in a, um, uh, in a regulated industry, security is less top of mind for you and you're really small uh, and uh, uh, things are not really urgent, you potentially could work without DevOps as well. Um, James. Yeah, so I think, go ahead, James, you had a question. And, 
Oh, I'm <clears> just going to say, and then we're going to now take you yeah, through what an yeah. actual DevOps is. I mean, if you were to dig like. a little bit deeper, right? I mean, like, what does, uh, what do people do with DevOps? So, I mean, by and large, I mean, there is a life cycle that sort of starts with like creating or setting up an account. And sometimes people obviously may already have an account. Then start with VPCs, VPNs, like if you're Microsoft customers, VNet and, and whatnot. So, it's really the networking infrastructure availability zones, VPC, VNet, subnets, routing. That happens. And then uh, once you have that in place, then you talk about like, you know, especially in cloud, uh, people use a lot of cloud native services. I mean, life is not no more about simple storage compute network. It's about databases, redisk caches, Elasticsearch, EMRs uh, um, uh, and whatnot. I mean, they're like boat loads of services in Amazon uh, um, that uh, that needs to be set up or in Azure and GCP as well. So you would go and configure all the platform services that includes EC2, S3, SQS, SNS, 3 days, service bus and whatnot. So once that is in place, then, you know, you have to figure out and sort of main, uh, create and maintain an app provisioning strategy. Like if you're a container shop, you do a lot of Docker containers. Kubernetes is top of mind. Um, if you are, let's say, uh, from the data space, managed Airflow or uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, like uh, EMR, um, that sort of thing, uh, uh, like serverless, Lambda functions, um, SageMaker, these are all like things which are more around app provisioning space, uh, model training, then logging, monitoring, alerting. You need to have CICD in place. And across the board, you need to really have loads and loads of compliance controls. And depending on what standard that uh, you have to be, and and we can sort of dig deeper into compliance, like in the in the next slide, um, and 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 then the idea, uh, James, we can go to the next one, and the idea behind like describing this is that we are really trying to sort of dig deeper into what uh, DevOps engineers sort of do, and and coming and I think overall security and compliance is going to be a lot of focus, and you'll see us hearing this quite a bit in this webinar, because like if you look at these standards, I mean like PCI has like 80 odd control, SOC2 also has like around 60 to 80, Hytrus has 80 plus, HIPAA 50, NIST um, 853 is like the is the biggest one, is like the mother of all. Uh, um, FedRAMP is based out of that, and they have loads of them, and there's like 200 plus controls. And I, we are talking about controls that apply to the cloud provider. We are obviously not talking to the rest of them. And surprisingly, I think 70% of them are provisioning time and about 30% of them are post provisioning. So from this, you can sort of see, right, if you take like one control uh, a day that you're already running into, like, let's say for PCI, about like 180 business days. Uh, and, and you can see like how much labor that really goes into, like, like that link that we have over here. I mean, Amazon's PCI guide is like thousands of pages long. Uh, the one, and it's, this is not what Amazon does. This is like what you as a customer has to do. So, so it's rather interesting about how um, involved this process actually can be. <clears throat> yeah, so I think uh, this is the typical org structure, right? Which is what we're talking about. There is a centralized DevOps team. There are uh, developers uh, and business stakeholders. They would provide a rather high level specification. OK, give me an environment, deploy these containers, give me a database, give me an Redis instance, or give me an S3 bucket, um, make it compliant to SOC2 or ISO. And that stuff goes to the DevOps team. And then what they do, by and large, is I would basically say they spend a lot of time stitching. The DevOps industry is fundamentally DIY, uh, do it yourself. So what one needs to do is that they need to take high level specification and translate it into boatloads of lower level configurations and tools like Terraform, Ansible, um, uh, uh, Python, even Bash, uh, they all come in handy. And then there are like other higher level tools that you could use, for example, the CICD tools, um, security tools, SIM solutions and whatnot. So I would say about like half of the time goes into security, um, also depends on what standard you're following. And then of course, this is like some very high level uh, tasks that you do in various other areas, like platform services, there are like lots of them nowadays. Uh, so that takes a lot of time. I would say the most mature area um, in the DevOps space is the CICD area. Um, especially with the latest tool and users tend to spend the minimum time. At least the DevOps engineers spend, tend to spend less time over there and then more things can be given to the developers themselves. But security is the area which really is, is a very big focus. 
Thank you, Venkat. And I'm going to take a pause right here to introduce Ajay. Um, you know, th there are a boatload of complexity that goes into this, but actually putting this into a real real world scenario and providing with what Ajay did at Cami Vision and, and implementing this through a real, real world scenario. Um, so Ajay, do you want to go ahead and talk about kind of what were the problems that uh, Cami Vision had, and how did you eventually kind of solution that out long term? And where, what is the status? Sure, of where sure. You're Thanks, at right James. Now? So I think at high level in Cami, let me first give a brief background of the company. So we are building a Vision AI platform that essentially allows us, as well as other customers, to build vision-based applications very quickly. So what that entails is that there is a platform that includes cameras, it includes a cloud backend, mobile apps for notifications, web UI to manage all the devices and uh, alerts. And we use that platform to essentially build different applications and use cases. Now, we run our uh, platform across multiple clouds. So we run basically across two different cloud providers, across four different regions. And we need to make sure that uh, developers have quick access to doing what they need to do. The overall cloud in every deployment is compliant and secure. And we need to make sure that we are not spending a lot of money on just dealing with DevOps and dealing with infrastructure stuff. Because in my mind, DevOps is a very critical role in the company. I mean, they essentially bring your application to life. But in some sense, it's also plumbing in the company that as long as it's working, nobody would notice. But if anything breaks, everybody uh, pays attention. So what we did essentially is we basically uh, built and launched a product with a very small DevOps team, mainly focusing on developers. And Duplo Cloud definitely played a key role in there. And we launched the product. It's live in multiple different cloud environments. In my previous life, whenever I had to deal with compliance, it has been a big nightmare. And it has taken a lot of time and resources from many roles in the company, not just even DevOps. And I think uh, making sure that the compliance requirements can be handled quickly, the audit can go smoothly, you don't have to basically uh, collect a lot of stuff manually that uh, we were able to do. And we went through that journey very uh, easily. And Finally, being able to deal with changes in the environment because any environment that you're working with is constantly changing. It's nothing is really static in a um, development world. And we are able to deal with a lot of these compliance and security challenges on the fly. That's fantastic. Thank you, Ajay. Um, and so want to dive into the cost categories on this. Really wondering what are what are some of the best practices from your experience? Yeah, um, I, I think one of the out. things is that, I mean, like I was saying before, invariably DevOps is a DIY, DIY system, uh, right? I mean, it's, it's rather ironical. I think uh, um, there are lots and lots of automation tools. In fact, like if you ask most DevOps team, uh, I've seen this all the time is that everything is automated, but the developer is always waiting for DevOps. So what does it mean? So what fundamentally it means is that I think um, a, much of the DevOps cost actually comes from the people. And uh, what do I mean by that? So if you compare DevOps with developer, I mean, if we were, we are really honest about it, right? Developers are actually the profit centers for an organization. What that means is that they are building a product. Product uh, um, technically is an, is infinite. You can keep evolving it based on the customer use cases and whatnot. DevOps, however ever complex it may be, end of the day, it's finite, basically. So uh, um, like I've heard this sometimes, it's like DevOps engineer talking about like automating themselves out of the job. Well, that may not completely be true, but then at the same time, it's also it's it's rather finite. So I would say 80 percent of the DevOps cost is people. And like uh, what we have seen mostly is that every 50 VMs, generally people would have one DevOps engineer or like the people if you're using like if you were to talk more in microservices language, probably 10 microservices across all environments would probably need like one DevOps engineer. 
and uh, where does the time go the time primarily goes in writing scripts uh, or infrastructure as code uh, or um, it actually goes in uh, interpreting compliance standards and implementing them interpreting is as important as uh, um, implementing because you need to know them and in fact if you look at the actual tools while most of you like if you are really from a very big company you have a really a huge security budget and i'm sure the security teams are big as well but if you go uh, lower down in the mid market and smaller companies thing a lot of the devops tools are almost free uh, effectively like terraform is free cloud formation is free um, cloud trail is like really really uh, low in pricing security hub as well although aws config is uh, um, uh, uh, is expensive but uh, even if you actually look at the productivity tools um, uh, like Jenkins, well, not Elasticsearch, uh, but, but in general, GitHub Actions and so on. So those are also not like super expensive. Um, Elasticsearch is a typo here. Uh, but in general, I think what we have seen is that the cost here is about, I would say, like 10 to 20 percent um, of the overall uh, um, uh, uh, spend when you compare it with people and so on, unless you're doing you really have some sort of an automation which which sort of like eliminates a lot of this cost uh, but if you want to cut cost it's really in automation and that directly has to uh, um, reflect in terms of the head count um, that either you are hiring or maybe you're trying to change and repurpose into some other purpose so i think we should be really be honest about it um, that the goal of devops uh, the cost of devops is a combination of people and tools and we shouldn't ignore the people cost because that's majority a vast majority of it is people. I mean, just to add um, there, James, if I may. Yeah. I think like in our case right now, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we have about two DevOps engineers where we are handling a few hundred uh, VMs just with two people. And one thing that I do um, want to emphasize is there are a lot of free tools and there are some paid tools, but it becomes a complex task to stitch everything together. So if you have a platform that can quickly stitch a bunch of tools together, help you quickly deploy some of these tools, it is a huge help. Otherwise, the team is spending a lot of time just stitching these uh, tools by themselves. Absolutely. That, that sounds like a huge problem. And this seems like the next question seems like, what every DevOps team is trying to figure out. Why are DevOps so scarce and why are they so expensive? Uh, I think I, Ajay, Rekha, do you want to take yeah, this Ajay right has now? been, uh, like has hired a few DevOps engineers, uh, my, me as well. Uh, but maybe Ajay, you can go first on this. <laughs> so I would say the first thing I want to mention is that, you know, it's a little bit of a specific and niche area. And you need to understand both some amount of development as well as operations. And the main problem that I see is a very high variance in the DevOps hiring. It's like you can find a person who knows few things and he would also be a DevOps engineer, although you would always have to watch what that person is doing. Or you really try to hire a person who knows what he is doing and that person would be very expensive. And I think Another problem that I see with DevOps hiring is a company always has over time a bunch of mish and mash of tools because who you hire, they bring their own favorite tool. It's like, you know, in one of my companies, we hire a person. He's like, oh, I love um, Chef. That's what I use for automation. After two years, another guy comes in. He's like, we always do Ansible. That is the best tool. Third guy comes in. He'll come in with Puppet. Now you essentially, after a few years, you pretty much have so many DevOps tools under your umbrella that just taking care of them becomes a problem because now you need five people just because you have 15 tools to deal with. And yeah. that has been a big challenge. So if there is a way where you basically have a tool which is a little bit of a standard and then everybody uses it, that is a huge uh, saving by itself. Yeah. I, and I think uh, uh, in general, I feel that, uh, um, uh, I mean, there is a need to sort of like uh, create an out-of-box solution. I mean, of course, that's what we try to do, right? I mean, so my biases aside, uh, um, like some sort of a DevOps as a service, just like cloud providers created infrastructure as a service and 
infrastructure had the same problems. Um, like how do you manage compute storage network? Should I buy Cisco Juniper or like what sort of like VM provisioning system should I buy and whatnot? And then they just said, OK, this is infrastructure as a service and it became a standard. And now we take it for granted. We don't even worry how VM got created or network got created. I think some sort of uh, um, uh, innovation over there is important. And then finally, the, I think the reason they are scarce is that product develop development operations and security these three are so different skills that even in college the courses don't like they, they're like very different degrees uh, to some extent basically right so uh, certainly expecting people to know all the three like no developer i've seen that really enjoys doing a lot of ops and i rarely find ops people who really are good at like really building those distributed systems and whatnot. Most DevOps people build attended systems in the sense, OK, you run a script or infrastructure as a code. You watch them. If it fails, you bail it out and stuff, right? which is very different than an, uh, and a product which basically runs by itself and uh, behind the scenes and whatnot. That's great. And now digging in a little bit further, um, DevOps hiring is so scarce and so hard, but um, talking about the individual factors that contribute right, right. to that. Depth. Yeah, I think these are like sort of the main factors. Let's say if we were to start with microservices and Kubernetes, right? I mean, microservices are great from an application perspective. I mean, I mean the advantage, I and mean, you can have a whole webinar about like why microservices is great and Kubernetes helps. Um, like different distributed systems, you can evolve rapidly, you can do things faster. One thing does not break other and whatnot but what it does is that it fragments your infrastructure basically right you have so many different moving pieces they have to come together they have to be secure the right people have to talk to each other so that really puts a burden on the devops team kubernetes is a management beast uh, right i mean like you can have uh, uh, so many people managing a kubernetes cluster which is like just like 50 vms or 100 vms or something right 100 vm i mean i've seen as many as like four or five engineers just dedicated to kubernetes clusters which is like 100 150 vms so uh, while it has uh, it has like all the power uh, uh, but much lesser grace right so and then the, and it's left to the devops teams to actually do that so you're getting into Kubernetes, be prepared to spend more on people, right? I mean, you can't just give it to somebody who is like very young engineer, like you really need an experienced person. Second thing uh, is I think the aspect of the compliance standard. I think SOC 2 and ISO are uh, easier to get. PCI is obviously a lot more intense and FedRAM takes like years, right? So, um, and the cost of FedRAM, for example, runs into millions of dollars. Uh, um, uh, like start, young companies don't even do it. And then similarly, SOC 2 can be done much faster. So compliance standard is really important. And we touched upon, it's basically because of how intense they are and how many controls you need to implement. Then finally, the third thing is about developer self-service. If you, you know, have a very small organization, you deploy, let's say, once a month, developers throw code over the fence, somebody goes, picks it up, rolls it out, and then, okay, come back after a month. I think that's that's much lightweight. But if you really want people adopting a lot of microservices, they want their changes all the time, want to move rapidly and stuff. So now you need to build all that automation and self-service. Now, how do you build that automation and self-service? So now you really need um, really good engineers sometimes. They are not even called DevOps. They would call themselves infrastructure engineers. And now they are building stuff on top of Python and uh, Bash and whatnot and make it really easy for people to self-serve without having to understand the nuances. And then finally, the infrastructure size. I mean, to some extent, um, uh, the size of the infrastructure determines that as well. And you can measure it either in terms of the number of VMs or if you're the microservices world, you could measure it based on the microservices that you have. So those are like by and large the uh, um, the standard. And I don't know if Ajay, if you had inputs because you've gone through all of this journey, I think, uh, right? Yeah, I mean, we have gone through, I have gone through compliance in previous life as well as now. And one thing that I feel that was very helpful is the fact that we can look at all these controls and previously we had to sort of manually enter how we are meeting the control good thing with a tool like Duplo was that we were able to pick up things that Duplo does out of the box and match it with the compliance requirement. But obviously, it's very hard to hire people who understand compliance requirements, who can meet all those requirements by themselves. And 
very few devops people have that level of understanding in previously actually we have had to hire external consultants to do this work because the internal people in the company in many cases don't know all the details and the developer self service one pain point that i have seen is on any cloud environment just doing access control which is fine grained where you say look you each developer or team has access to certain amount of resources that itself becomes a huge pain point and in many cases i see companies giving either to lose a control where half of the team is admin or giving to restricted a control where everything that should take 2 hours it takes 5 days so it's a tricky balance to uh, get within a company yeah and and my favorite example of like good devops engineers not sometimes knowing compliance standards is like okay there's an infosec uh, um, uh, um auditor or a uh, or, or a person and the question is like okay how do you manage vulnerabilities well this is i use for and then the response would be this is what i use for virus scanning it's like no 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 how do you do vulnerabilities right and they'll be like oh i use clam av so so i i think like sometimes that creates a wrong impression and then um the end customer may walk away with a wrong impression or though the, the the team has like good knowledge in terms of operations but they may not know the actual standards um and and more around like compute compliance and infosec uh, that's fantastic um so we've identified that hiring for devops is very scarce it's extremely expensive and there are a lot of factors that go into it um you have to hire the right people with the right technology with of the right expertise who have come uh with use of the right technology. Now let's talk about how do we solution this? What are some of the approaches in reducing this DevOps spend? Yeah. So Ajay, you want to take this because uh, I think you evaluated a lot of these. So I mean I think in terms of our evaluation, we briefly looked at external paths and we looked at various solutions in that space uh, like Heroku and others. and they definitely reduce the devops work but they also put lot of restrictions on your team so when the team wants to do certain things they are like oh but i want to do it in this way we are not able to do it and it becomes harder and harder as your application grows and as your overall stack becomes more complicated so we decided not to go with an external pass solution and in my previous life we essentially have used something where the devops team act as a buffer between the developers and the infrastructure where they would build some automation and some scripts and things like that you can call it like a a developer platform but in many cases developers don't get direct access to that they have to go through devops they have to file tickets then something gets provisioned then they get back the details and the access uh, credentials and having something in my mind which is a more developer self service platform is very desirable where developers can go and just do something and i would say as a cto what i would like is to make sure that when they are doing this they are not making mistakes and i don't lose sleep at night saying what if they provision something they open some ports they put some database in some public subnet there are so many ways you can make mistakes these days if anything i would say cloud has made it easier to make mistakes and then you buy tools to then monitor and see what mistake was made and then try to go and fix that yeah and uh, and and like just to be more specific in terms of examples like for example the most popular um, external pass which pretty much eliminates devops is actually heroku it, which is pretty amazing i mean like the way heroku works and they have a big user base and stuff but i think the main limitation is that you uh, organization grow out of heroku uh, that's one and then second is that it doesn't have like obviously the functionalities that amazon has but then the disadvantage is that if you have to move from heroku to amazon now you have to do all of the devops yourself so i mean that's where i think sort of we come in um and then uh, uh, like uh, with sort of the idp solution that we talked about which is basically to um install a virtual machine in your cloud account uh, and it gives you a web portal and um a, a terraform interface uh, and then it's like devops as a service so 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 i think those are 
either you can build it in house uh, and i think if you're really operating at a large scale like for example netflix spotify facebook and so on it makes a lot of sense to actually build it in house because there is no getting away from it at that scale like i mean those developers will not wait around um, to get things done so either you can build it in house or you can look for solutions out of box outside or the obviously the other alternative is you can go with the pace of manual devops and that's fine too yeah. i mean i feel going forward in the next i would say 2 to 4 years most companies they would look for something like a internal developer platform which the developers can directly access they can get their work done but they still should not be able to cause damage as much as possible from the security point of view right right and i think that's a change about to happen i mean like infrastructure as a service we all take it for granted fast forward 4 years i think we'll probably not be having a lot of this devops conversation we'll be like yeah devops as a service this vendor that vendor let's find the best one among those and then let's just go with that so so i think that's change is inevitable And yeah, summer, I think uh, uh, I would basically say, this? by and large, I think uh, be honest with your DevOps spend. Don't ignore the people cost because that's where the actual people cost comes in, uh, right? I think I would say uh, uh, 60 to 80 percent uh, is by and large people, and the rest of it is tool, um, especially in small organizations. Um, DevOps is really a niche skill. I mean, it's not easy to hire. Like Ajay said, there's a huge variance, right? I mean, you can find a so-so DevOps engineer, and you can really find somebody whom you'll be like, oh. is like uh, really awesome and then i think yeah if you want to control the spend i think there are really two ways one is that compliance standard i mean that would be determined by your industry uh, you probably cannot help much microservices kubernetes uh, i think um, uh, they give you obvious optimizations but they're not cheap uh, right and then developer self service figure out you really need it or you don't and obviously the size of the infrastructure and uh, um and yeah and finally i think this is a problem that um, is going to be solved uh, it's a matter of time right i mean devops is ought to become uh, as a service offering you can call it idp devops as a service and so on but you don't have to devops doesn't have to be diy right i think that's i'm pretty confident that will change <laughs>